Wonderful to be talking with uh, Kunal here today. Kunal is, of course, India's first generation e-commerce entrepreneur and has done some wonderful things at Snapdeal. But also probably little known is that he's also a very big venture capitalist with Titan Capital. They've made several investments in very promising startups. And that's where, uh, you know, we're we going to talk to today about Kunal, about the, what he thinks about the Indian startup ecosystem. I mean, Kunal, you, um, you know, you started probably at a time when uh, you were building the first uh, sort of uh, startup ecosystem in India, the first uh, level of startup ecosystem in India, where, you know, thinking of becoming a billion dollar organization or a large organization was a dream that was wanting to be achieved. But today, you know, it's something that every startup sort of looks forward to, plus a lot more. Um, so that becoming a unicorn has become almost like a easy thing now um, versus what it used to be back in 2010 or 2011. So how do you think this, uh, particularly in the last six or seven years, how do you think the startup ecosystem has changed in the country? And what kind of startups are you betting high on? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ritu, and thanks to the IIT Bombay team for having me. Um, uh, you're absolutely right that uh, we seem to be seeing a lot more unicorns being, being uh, uh, coming out of India now. But I must say that I have a slightly different view in terms of whether it's uh, it's become an easy thing. It is not. I, I asked yeah, no, that never is. entrepreneurs who've uh, hit that milestone, and you will hear of uh, many, many stories wow. of uh, blood, sweat, and tears, and, and ask the many entrepreneurs who want to get there, and they have their own stories of blood, sweat, and tears. So it's not easy um, uh, getting getting there, but but I think entrepreneurship is obviously much more than just uh, getting to a $1 million valuation. It's about creating impact. It's about creating jobs. It's about creating a, a better world uh, and creating products and services that million that touch the lives of millions of people. Over the last, um, maybe I would say 10 years or so, there is India's e-commerce, not only e-commerce, but overall startup ecosystem has gone through a tectonic plate shift. I remember when we started a little over 10 years ago, uh, startup word was not part of the dictionary. Uh, you essentially had a good job or you were a struggler. And, um, and I think uh, it generally folks who are doing startups, as we call them now, were uh, considered to be people who didn't uh, have the ability to get a good job. And so there was a bit of an adverse selection attached to uh, doing a startup uh, 10 years ago. A lot has changed now, obviously, um, you know, thanks to the government, thanks to, uh, you know, the bureaucracy, thanks to uh, industrialists, uh, industrial groups in the country, thanks to the VC ecosystem, thanks to the domestic uh, investor ecosystem in India. And obviously, thanks to the thousands and thousands of entrepreneurs who have decided to give up jobs and uh, or not take up jobs after college and start uh, start companies. As a result, now, you know, I don't think there is any get together, social gathering, party, anywhere in the country where someone's not talking about startups. Correct. And that's how much our country has, uh, has transformed over the last decade when it comes to startups. Startups are now seen as the solution to, a, to, to building a great country, right? Like they're no longer seen as these, you know, few 20, 20 somethings or 30 somethings um, uh, year olds are going and building something on the side that nobody else understands. The, the solutions that startups are coming up with in India are touching lives of many of us every day. And, and I think that is some that is the true power of, uh, of India's startup ecosystem. So I'm, I'm obviously a, a passionate participant and proponent of the startup ecosystem. Uh, and, and I think I'm so optimistic for what the next decade holds for, uh, for it. Sure. And you know, since we're talking to the IIT students here in Mumbai uh, for the eSummit 21, um, you know what, um, today, of course, a lot of them would be looking to do startups, but also some of them would be looking to join jobs and look at professional careers. So what are the new age skills do you think every, um, you know, IIT uh, graduate should have other than what, of course, they are being taught in college, which is like almost like compulsory, it's a must to have uh, today. And that could, of course, take them far and probably, you know, uh, have them sort of 
have some career set in the next 10 years because things are changing so dynamically around us as it is. Yeah, I think um, yeah, I feel that the skills that are needed to do a job well uh, will get picked up either in college or uh, will get picked up through tribal knowledge of talking to uh, friends or reading stuff up or even while being uh, at a job, right? Um, I feel that the skills that really do matter, however, if you want to build a large, high impact company from scratch, are people skills. That is what is probably the single biggest skill that is often not taught in, um, uh, in colleges, particularly technical colleges oftentimes. But those are the skills that are usually the most important. The ability to invigorate, the ability to inspire uh, a team of one to a team of maybe 10,000 one day uh, to you know, define a vision for them and have them believe in that vision, uh, to be able to stand in front of hundreds and hundreds of people, of your colleagues, of your employees, and, and inspire them to, to achieve great things, especially if things are not going too well. I think those are the skills that, uh, that if you were to ask me what are the new age skills, I would say those are the most important skills when one needs to lead a startup into, into a large company. Uh, the, the subject matter expertise can be learned, can be taught, can be hired also. But, sure. um, but what, what really makes a big difference is the ability to lead uh, people. The ability to lead people, hire and lead people who are going to be oftentimes smarter than you are. And, and that's, that's probably the single biggest skill that is needed to build a, a successful company. Sure, people skills, that is. So for all the students out there <clears throat> who are listening to this one, um, you know, uh, Kunal, e-commerce has changed so much, particularly during this pandemic. Um, you know, I see new streams of e-commerce and social commerce and this hyper-local e-commerce and so many uh, WhatsApp e-commerce, uh, which was uh, recently being talked about. So how do you think e-commerce has changed, but particularly what has the pandemic done for it? I mean, you know, has it given it the spurt, which otherwise probably would have taken a few more years to happen? Yeah, um, I think there has been a spurt, but I feel the underpinnings of uh, the e-commerce uh, taking off in India have been um, underway for, for a while. Um, it started with companies like ourselves, almost educating both the demand side and the supply side, consumers and sellers online about the virtues of e-commerce. It was a hard problem many years ago. Both, neither side trusted that there was, a, the, there was a possibility that you could go to a website, buy things and give them money and then that, that product will actually get delivered. Uh, however crazy it sounds, maybe eight, 10 years ago, large majority of Indian consumers did not believe that would actually happen. And large number of sellers also did not believe that that would actually happen. Uh, that they could supply their products online. But looking at the success of some of the companies uh, that were early in the ecosystem, we've now seen a vast number of companies open across various verticals of the economy, both on the B2B side, B2C side, um, folks who are doing wholesaling of clothes, folks who are doing retailing of agricultural inputs. Um, there is an explosion of digitization of commerce that is happening in our country as we speak. Mm -hmm. I have the good fortune of meeting so many uh, incredible entrepreneurs who are just starting off their journey. And it is absolutely mind blowing uh, the creativity of the problem solving skills that they have um, using technology that are connecting the dots between demand and supply across different parts of our economy. And in some ways, um, either enabling <coughs> The intermediaries or in some where, where the intermediaries actually add value or in some cases um, you know skipping the intermediaries where the intermediaries were primarily adding cost and not any value and both are happening and both are necessary um, so I, I but specifically in answer to your question Ritu I would say agriculture um, uh, health uh, and creation of new brands these are the three relatively new areas in e-commerce specifically that we are seeing tremendous amount of activity, entrepreneurial activity, 
and 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 really high impact businesses will will get built in these three areas in the next uh, next few years and do you think uh, i mean within b2b and b2c where do you see bigger scope of things to happen i think it's it's like picking between two children uh, <laughs> I, it's it's very hard to say i think both play an important role there is a consumption economy and there is a business economy and both require uh, the enablement of technology to bring more efficiency um so they are two different types of problem statements in two different parts of the economy obviously with some interlinkages however um, both are very critical uh, b2c is often criticized from the perspective that it takes a lot of capital to uh, shape consumer behavior to acquire customers b2b from that perspective is uh, uh, is a little more capital efficient a business model but look often times it's also a personal preference of uh, the entrepreneur as to what opportunity they are finding more exciting and passion uh, and and are passionate about um many many entrepreneurs are very passionate about building b2b businesses versus others who are passionate about building end consumer brands or b2c businesses so i don't think there's a right or wrong answer or large or small uh, i feel there is tremendous amount of asymmetry of information in the economy in any economy including ours uh, and and what marketplaces whether they are b2b or b2c can do is reduce that asymmetry of information sure and i mean you know you you've been uh, uh, so, uh, particularly with your fund which is titan capital you've been investing in so many companies which come in both these spheres both b2b as well as b2c um so you know where where are you seeing bigger opportunities when it comes to investing um, for at new startups yeah i think um, you know i'm i generally have a space agnostic view on um, on on the opportunities or the business model etc uh, there are three attributes i would look for one is um, which may not be very different from other investors but maybe we just we are very focused on just these three attributes one is um, just the quality of the team right um, we need to uh, we understand that there is almost no information at the early stages when we when we would invest in a company however the quality of the team the some amount of demonstration of success in their past life whether it could be professional academic um, somewhere they should have done something that created impact because you know that tells us whether they have that fire within them uh, to to keep going and to actually have the passion and the hustle to deliver uh, results so i think the team is a very critical role also we we like backing dreamers we want we want uh, entrepreneurs who can make us dream with them who can help us gaze into the crystal ball with them as to what can this business eventually become the second would be just the size of the opportunity so uh, i the space is not as important as the size we obviously want to dedicate our uh, resources uh, time energy network to support entrepreneurs who are looking to build large businesses um, sure. i'm not saying building a a small business is 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 not a great thing it is it it probably just doesn't need our uh, participation then as much so large businesses is very uh, pursuing large business opportunities is very important to us as it is to most entrepreneurs that we meet and and the third is the ability to generate economics um we 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 like businesses that at least have a viewpoint on how they will make money um because that's the only way to sustain and build a lasting enduring enterprise long time uh, in the long term because you can you can keep uh, raising money up to a certain uh time uh, but beyond that point you will have to self sustain and hence having a point of view on how will you self sustain and grow your business thereafter it's important to know from the get go so i would say those are the three things but more specifically i would say you know marketplaces whether they are b2b b2c fintech computer vision um you know online brands or direct to consumer brands um you know some SA also like software companies like SA SA various saas companies i think we've looked at everything we've invested in everything uh, so we are not um uh, our, our our philosophy is we are never dismissive about the business model or the business idea 
uh, we tend to spend more time on the three things I mentioned, the, the team, the size of opportunity, and the ability to generate economics. Sure. And I mean, particularly the markets have been going, they've been rocking uh, in, in during these last few months. You know, we touched the 50,000 mark, which is pretty historic uh, for our stock markets. Do you think a lot of startups should now start looking at IPOs as a route to raise capital and also to give exit to investors? Yeah, I think by the time they are ready to go public uh, or IPO, I don't think we should be calling them startups. Um, uh, but But I do feel that irrespective of whether the stock markets are going up or down uh, in the near term. We've all seen that these are phases. Uh, none of these um, you know, troughs or bubbles in the stock markets last forever. Over a period of time, if you zoom out, the trend line is obviously upwards always. It just as the economies become more efficient and more, more, uh, you know, more innovation and productivity uh, increases are happening. That said, um, I, I do feel irrespective of the market cycles or the uh, stock market cycles, the future of any ecosystem uh, rests in the hands of the, the few companies that actually go public. Most large startup ecosystems around the world, the enduring startup ecosystems like Silicon Valley, um, China, have have endured and have become larger over time because they have gotten created around a few really really good high quality companies tech companies that went public early um, because that always gives a sense of confidence to investors as well as entrepreneurs as well as employees of the uh, startups that there is a there is an exit here in due course they can point to something and say look this is what we will become eventually. This is our outcome, five years out, 10 years out. In the absence of that, the only um, exit is selling to some company. And oftentimes that company ends up being some overseas foreign company because they have far more resources than another local startup they have. Um, and that never inspires confidence into, uh, into investors uh, coming into a business or employees wanting to come, on, come into the startup ecosystem. Um, and this is the difference between the U.S. startup ecosystem and the European startup ecosystem. And not many companies out of Europe traditionally have gone public. Um, last couple of years, things have changed a little bit, but for the longest time, that didn't happen. As a result, we never hear as much about you know, global uh, companies or global significance come out of the European startup ecosystem. But we hear about that every few months out of the U.S. startup ecosystem. And in my view, the big difference is a number of uh, public companies coming out of their respective countries' startup ecosystems. And India will need dozens and dozens of technology companies going public and be, being successful public companies. And we will see a significant explosion, even more than we see right now, uh, in the Indian startup ecosystem and entrepreneurial ecosystem. Sure. You know, India took its startup India initiative about five years back. Do you think um, the Indian government should now also allow Indian startups to list on international bourses? You know, that that might just open up more avenues and also make it easy, especially for Indian startups to be serving international markets. Yeah, absolutely. And look, my view is that um, if, if we are building world class companies, we should be open to world class capital. Um, and there is great capital available in India, but there are pools of capital available overseas who would probably just out of their own internal restrictions not come to India specifically to invest in one company. Um, we do allow you know, private, foreign private equity players to come invest in Indian companies. Right? So why can't we allow other, uh, other investors who are purely maybe public market investors on, on, uh, on global stock exchanges to invest in our companies? It's great because that capital that will get raised outside India will make its way to India eventually, right? It's not going to stay there because if it's an Indian company that has Indian operations, Indian customers, Indian suppliers, Indian te technology built in India, even if we do, even if they end up raising capital on overseas stock exchanges, they will bring that capital to India. Uh, to, to actually uh, grow their businesses. So in the end, India wins. 
and more importantly you know just the soft power that india gets out of having large successful technology companies listed overseas uh, there is a lot of soft power attached to that for our country as well where uh, like same way infosys being listed abroad gives india a lot of soft power there's a lot of respect attached to indian businesses and indian business in general when they see such successful uh, you know companies out of india listed on foreign exchanges with great governance great track records it raises the profile of the entire country and gives us more reasons to be proud about our country so i absolutely feel that our uh, uh, that we should you know we should allow the government should allow indian startups to to or indian companies in general to list abroad if they want to and list in india if they want to whatever they feel is right for their business to raise capital um, uh, company should be allowed to do that and um, i mean you know since you're investing so much uh, in the indian startups are you also keen to invest in startups which are not in india european or american startups and particularly for you know ideas like cryptocurrencies which probably in india are not uh, legal but you know outside in in the world they are almost like a legal currency so um, yeah i think we've been, uh, been investing in um, in both uh, southeast asian as well as uh us startups uh, more from more than just looking at them as a means of return but more more from the perspective of learning um the us market sometimes in some spaces uh, some sub sectors of the startup ecosystem tends to uh, be a little ahead uh, of the indian startup ecosystem at least in some areas and by being entrenched in that ecosystem as an investor as well allows us to look into the crystal ball as to what are the trends that may be coming through to india soon uh, southeast asia is very similar to india often times we have indian entrepreneurs running businesses in southeast asia so there is a lot of you know it's almost like an extension for all practical purposes of the indian startup ecosystem um but i think particularly the us startup ecosystem uh, we backed many companies there invested in many companies there at the earlier stages some of them have become unicorns and have become quite large uh, it has really helped us get into an, into the into get a lens into uh, the various trends uh, that will likely hit the indian shores in the coming years as well sure and you know well we're almost at the end of our time um, let me ask you this that you know digitization is something that sort of really emerged as the as the the king uh, during this time and uh, i mean you know and that of course requires a very uh, uh, big b2b uh, ecosystem to develop to be able to service this uh, digitization drive but honestly i mean for a lot of smes manufacturing businesses family businesses to change in india what what would be your advice to them to uh, really to be able to adopt digitization and to make the most of it the idea is not just to become a digital and start selling uh, online but really to make it as a fundamental value system of your business what what needs to change for them i think having an open mind <laughs> probably you know everything every every technology every many things around us that we take for granted at one point were termed as uh something new or what we call or oh, this is technology right uh um, at some point electricity was that at some point cars were that um you know so at at one point even computers were that not to not to long ago right? yeah um but what i have seen is that there is a natural selection there obviously there is a there is a, a responsibility uh, industry has governments have to create awareness amongst those who may not have access to uh, all the information but assuming that there is wide scale awareness about the virtues of technology there are trainings available uh, with the uh, with youtube i mean youtube is the world's university in some ways right like uh, if someone wants to learn something they are no longer going and searching on google and reading something they are going on youtube and watching something and learning right it it may not give the in depth view on how to do something but it will give you a fairly good overview in a in a simple in a very simplified manner that 
anyone would understand, a layman yeah. would understand. That said, assuming that, let's assume that there is a lot of availability of information and evangelizing has been done around the virtues of digitization. And more will be done, but I think a lot has been done from the prime minister uh, uh, down um, and across the industry. After that, I feel it follows a process of natural selection. Uh, companies, large or small, that adopt technology tend to grow, thrive, uh, tend to expand into new avenues, become more efficient, um, uh, hire great people. And companies that don't, because they just don't want to recognize the, the shift that is happening in the world, uh, in the world around them, uh, in their industry even, uh, they get left behind. The same things happened uh, over and over again across sectors, across decades, maybe even across, uh, across centuries. And this is no different. I feel as, as industry leaders, um, folks like us have a responsibility to evangelize uh, to the broader nation. Obviously, the government plays a big role there and has been playing a big role with Digital India and Startup India. Uh, but beyond a point, you can't go to someone's house and tell them that, look, if you don't use this, your business will face an existential risk. I think that recognition has to come from the business itself. Um, uh, once all the efforts have been put to create the re requisite awareness. Sure. And, you know, finally, I mean, today, as a lot of IIT students uh, who look to do a lot of um, you know startups and build their own organizations what would be your final advice to them you know how to have more guarded optimism you know it's 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 a great time to do a startup and you know there is a lot of capital also uh, available to back up some innovative ideas but it's still important to be more guarded uh, rather than being overly optimistic about building your business no i i, <laughs> I will probably again not I have a different view. Uh, I feel that there is absolutely no reason that everyone shouldn't be trying their hand at either starting a company or joining a startup. Uh, if, if you are a student at IIT Bombay, your risk is already so low because of, you know, you have one of the best uh, degrees that anyone could get in the whole world you have one of the best access to one of the best peer groups that anyone could have in the whole world. You have access to one of the best alumni networks that anyone could have in the whole world, not just in India. Your risk is already limited. Now, you may not have a great idea right now. And so don't just go head first into the first idea that comes to your mind, uh, just because you, know, you want to do a startup. Uh, go join a startup in the meanwhile. Keep working on whatever idea you have or ideas you may have on the side. And when you feel you will re you are ready and you will know when you're ready, the, the voice from within you will tell you that you will not be able to think of anything else from the morning when you wake up, when you're in the shower, all day long when you're at work, you'll be only able to think about that one idea. That's when you know you are ready to go. Um, and you should go start your own company but I don't see any reason that anyone who's graduating from IIT Bombay this year should be pursuing anything else but either joining a startup or starting a startup. Um, and, and I can tell you that the, the many, many hundreds of entrepreneurs I've had the good fortune of supporting and backing or investing behind, um, they either all started very early or they all tell me, or if they were older, when they started, they, they tell me that they wish they had started early. Um, I started uh, our company uh, one year out of college. Um, and, and, you know, I don't think there is, beyond a point, there is diminishing returns to probably just being in the workforce if what your true calling is going, is, uh, going and starting a company. Sure. Well, thanks for that, Kunal. That certainly gives the hopes up to all the students out there listening to this and uh, to all people who want to do their startup, you know, that uh, the, the time is now. And of course, if you have the right idea, just go after it and go out and do your own business. Well, that's it for us, for me and Kunal uh, on this chat. Um, any final words as we close this, uh, Kunal? 
No, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ritu. Thanks so much for having me. Um, you know, I'm so, so optimistic and excited about uh, the startup ecosystem in India. And, uh, you know, I've had the good fortune of backing you know, dozens of um, uh, really great entrepreneurs from IIT Bombay. Uh, we have some colleagues who are from IIT Bombay in our company as well. And, um, and, and, I, I, and I hope one day to meet some of you and, and talk with you and, and, and brainstorm with you about the businesses you're going to build. And of course, we'll be happy to write about them here at Entrepreneur and uh, share your uh, ideas and innovative uh, businesses that you're building. And uh, and hopefully next time we meet Kunal, it should not be on the confines of a screen, but in person as we are almost there out of the pandemic and uh, uh, literally looking to go ahead racing and building big organizations in big India as we go ahead. Thank you for this talk.